Um, it's a great opportunity to be here with you in Merida uh, talking about a topic that um, I find really fascinating uh, to think about um, and I think that it has great importance uh, in the 21st century. So um, what I'd like to do is to spend the next 20-25 minutes going over a number of high-level concepts um, and introducing people who have different le levels of expertise in different areas to some of the differences in areas and perhaps uh, introduce some vocabulary if need be. Um, but I think that it'll be, uh, I, I'm sort of the warm-up act for um, Chetan and Marcelo uh, in a sense. So uh, they'll go into more detail about their areas. I will talk a little bit about drugs um, because uh, Pedro's not here uh, and we'll talk a bit about that and, and, and I'll spend some time on international aspects and epidemiology, things that interest me programmatically as well. So I think that it's fair to say everybody here is probably familiar with uh, the latest data on malaria and the um, tremendous burden that it imposes globally. There are still 207 million clinical cases, 627 deaths annually in 2012, uh, an ongoing transmission and 45% of the population of the world's population is at risk uh, due to five different uh, plasmodium species. Um, but as shocking in some sense as those numbers are, they represent a vast improvement over where we were a number of years ago. And um, we have undertaken a very, very aggressive, as a, as a global community, we have undertaken a very aggressive strategy to eliminate malaria in the past decade, um, which basically pursued aggressive control in high burden regions progressive elimination from endemic area regions, so-called shrinking the map, um, and trying to expand the R&D pipeline to develop new tools and techniques that would enable us to better control uh, what malaria, uh, uh, to better control malaria. Now, all three of these are absolutely critical and they need to be pursued simultaneously, but we've been doing that, and the evidence that we're having an impact is shown on this slide, where you can, uh, we've had a 26% uh, reduction in malaria mortality in the decade from 2000 to 2010, including a 33% reduction in the most highly afflicted area uh, in Africa. 50 countries are on track to reduce malaria incidence by 75% by 2015. And what you can see in this map here is that um, this area here, you can see these large areas that are green are areas that where malaria has, are malaria free. These areas that are blue uh, are areas that are now eliminating malaria and the areas that are red are areas that are controlling malaria much more effectively. So we have made tremendous progress uh, in the past decade, so much so that we can actually anticipate and uh, what the, the possibility of malaria eradication, or the so-called future perfect. Um, this was actually raised uh, Am I going too far? Can we go back one slide? Okay, the possibility of malaria eradication had actually been raised back in the late 50s um, and uh, was pursued rather aggressively and then uh, it tr proved to be extremely difficult at that time and was gradually abandoned. But in 2007, at the Gates Malaria Forum, the possibility of eradicating malaria again was raised. But I think the, the crucial difference here was that and this came up in some of the discussions that went on at an initiative called Malera, was that research had to be an integral part of any sort of future eradication effort. Um, and even uh, in this early uh, setting here, where Bill and Melinda Gates were talking about malaria eradication, the important issue here that was raised was developing the scientific breakthroughs that would be needed to end this disease. And that's what we're going to talk quite a bit about over the next uh, several days. Okay, so one of the 
points that I, as I was thinking about this that was rather interesting is that this is not without precedent. There has been an ongoing discussion about the appropriate role of science in a variety of different uh, activities. And there's this tension that sometimes exists in the community between the quest for trying to improve our fundamental understanding and people who are really interested in saying, no, 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 we need to use the science to achieve some objective. And uh, this was actually brought out very nicely in a book uh, by Donald Stokes uh, in 1997, where he talked about uh, science as being grouped into different quadrants. Um, so depending on the, whether you were pursuing fundamental understanding or considering use primarily. So it, for those of you who are interested, um, fundamental understanding as envisioned by Niels Bohr, the physicist was basically, I want to understand how the atoms, how an atom works, uh, and I don't really care how it's, how it's used. Um, he didn't necessarily say it that way, but that was sort of what motivated. His motivation was really to understand the atom. In contrast, you had people like Thomas Edison who basically said, you know, I just care that I have a better light bulb. I don't really care why I have a better light bulb, but I want a better light bulb. But then the interesting uh, category here is those people who try to pursue both. And the example of that that is mentioned in this book is Pasteur. And Pasteur's research was largely motivated by his desire to have a practical effect, but he realized that in order to do that, he was going to have to go back and understand some fundamental processes, uh, whether that was understanding the, how anthrax caused disease uh, and trying to develop a vaccine for anthrax or whether it was understanding uh, fermentation better so he could produce uh, a better beer, which was actually uh, an important uh, product for Alsace, the part of France that he was living in. Um, so he had a very, yes, he was very practical, but he really believed in going back to fundamental roots of science and understanding what that was. And I would argue that malaria eradication is very similar in that sense. We have a very practical, long-term objective here. We want to eradicate a disease. We know it's been done before for other diseases. We believe that it can be done for malaria. What we don't have is all the tools, but we know or we believe that science, when applied appropriately, can actually provide insights that will enable us to develop those tools. So how do we get from uh, malaria elimination to eradication? Well, first of all, we need to acknowledge up front that eradication is a long-term futuristic goal. And it will, have to be built, uh, it will have to be built on new epidemiologic scenarios because it is not a static target that we are dealing with. And it will require improved use of current tools, adaptation of those tools to new epidemiologic scenarios. We will need to discover develop and evaluate new tools, and we will need to effectively integrate multiple different interventions across different programs and across different settings if we are going to achieve this objective. And so what I'm going to do is to go through some aspects of these different tools and the processes by which we are trying to uh, achieve uh, some of these objectives. Around the same time that the Gates Malaria Forum uh, came out uh, with the call for malaria eradication at NIAID, we were actually revamping our strategic plan and research agenda. And in fact, we came up with these two documents which are available on the web. And actually, what was interesting is that they actually anticipated a lot of the issues that came up uh, as the efforts to pursue malaria eradication became uh, formulated. Um, one of the key issues that I've already alluded to, but which is also mentioned uh, in this report, is the fact that there are a variety of different uh, interventional approaches that one could take to achieve malaria eradication, whether we're talking about vaccines or therapeutics or vector management. And some of these are sort of more traditional elements. 
um, over in here, for example, but some of them require new understanding and a better approach uh, to accelerate their development. For example, gametocytocidal drugs or uh, transgenic mosquitoes. And some of these are things that Chaitan and uh, Marcelo, I'm sure, will be going into, um, if, unless I've completely missed the boat here. But, Okay, so given that we have multiple interventions and that they're being applied effectively, the thing that we are seeing, which you saw on that map, is that there are, is, there are some major changes occurring in the epidemiology of malaria. That's very interesting, very encouraging, but what does it mean for the future directions of our research? And here, I've just highlighted some of the issues that will be coming up uh, over the next several years as we continue to make progress in these areas. But, if one thinks about the rapidly changing epidemiology with decreased incidence and transmission, then we have to start thinking about things like the possibility that there will be changes in the target populations for the interventions. How are we going to diagnose the disease? Are there optimal mixes of interventions that we would want to use in certain settings and not in other settings? As, sample, as the incidence of disease goes down, trial size can go way up. And for transmission blocking vaccines, we may need to think the, rethink the conventional uh, trial designs and use cluster designed uh, trials as an example uh, more efficiently and more effectively. Or we have to develop alternative endpoints that would allow us to think differently about this. There's been an increased interest in non falciparum malaria outside of Africa and an in increased interest in non Gambienze anopheline vectors. As I'll show you in a little bit, there's been, uh, not surprisingly, uh, increased drug resistance and tolerance. So how do we address this? We're going to have to think about new drug combinations, new drugs, no novel diagnostics for drug resistance, and how they fit, fit into some of these control strategies. Emerging insecticide resistance and altered vector behavior may also represent uh, opportunities to, or pose new challenges for uh, thinking about how we are going to move forward with uh, our control programs and our development of interventions. And then the potential licensure of a first-generation malaria vaccine has a whole lot of implications for how the vaccines would be integrated into malaria control, elimination, eradication programs, and what are the expectations, the so-called um, current status uh, for uh, uh, therapy or for prevention if a new vaccine is introduced? And then how will that affect future development of new vaccines? So thinking about these um, in, in that context of the strategic plan and the research agenda that we had put together, um, Dr. Fauci and I, um, as we were thinking about these, came up with this, uh, wrote this article uh, in which we were trying to emphasize that just as the epidemiology was changing, we would have to have a responsive uh, res biomedical research agenda that would also evolve in response to the, un uh, the changing needs. And we identified five challenges, which are listed here, including translating genomics and a variety of other new tools into new interventions, improving our ability to diagnose ma malaria, blocking transmission, and expanding the research base for Plasmodium vivax and other human uh, non falciparum malarias. These two are, are of particular interest uh, for eradication. And then ensuring that this was a sustainable enterprise that could endure over a long period of time that would be required for uh, research uh, and development to eradicate uh, malaria. We based our conclusions and our recommendations uh, coming out of that, our, our perspective, on the biology of the parasite. This shows the life cycle. And obviously, there are a number of points of interventions, whether it's in the mosquito, at the, in the pre-erythrocytic stage, in the asexual blood stage, or in the sexual stage. But also of interest here were these two transmission bottlenecks that existed uh, occur that, uh, occurring when uh, parasites are transmitted from humans to mosquitoes or from mosquitoes back to humans. And we'll uh, talk a little bit more about that. The other thing that I think is important to recommend that, uh, or to, to consider when discussing uh, uh, eradication is that a lot of the efforts to date have been focused on falciparum, but when you think about vivax, there are important differences in the life cycle. 
that uh, impact our ability to uh, control, uh, eliminate, and potentially eradicate vivax. And I've listed some of them here um, because they have implications for the types of interventions that we would want to think about developing. So for example, falciparum uh, can complete its life cycle uh, in the mosquito, its mat maturation uh, period, uh, at 16 degrees, but vivax actually can survive at lower temperatures. Uh, vivax has a dormant liver stage, falciparum does not, and gametocytes uh, in vivax appear concurrently with asexual blood stages, uh, often when individuals are asymptomatic, uh, whereas uh, with falciparum they occur after asexual blood stage infection is established. So these biological differences inform the types of interventions that we would think about uh, developing. In terms of diagnostics, microscopy really does, uh, remains widely used, uh, but RDTs have become, have been used increasingly as they become less expensive. And the great advantage is that they improve the diagnosis, it make it more accurate, uh, they promote appropriate treatments, and they reduce the expenses of malaria control uh, as they allow people to be more targeted. But RDTs aren't necessarily going to function the same in high incidence settings as they do in low incidence settings, and we may have to rethink how we're using those in the future. So basically that's this point here about improving them uh, and refining them for low incidence settings. We'd like to move to non-invasive sampling. Uh, and detection of G6PD deficiency in patients with vivax infection so we can actually treat them or treat large portions of the population uh, with drugs that actually uh, elicit adverse events in some individuals with this uh, metabolic uh, deficiency. Some of the clear and present dangers to our success to date include artemisinin resistance in Southeast Asia and insecticide resistance in Africa. So efforts to contain artemisinin resistance are ongoing. The WHO came out with this global plan for artemisinin resistance containment. This is where, what the situation was in 2012, and all these red dots here indicate the areas of confirmed or suspected artemisinin resistance. The situation has continued to progress, uh, so much so that the WHO then came out with an emergency response uh, to artemisinin resistance in the greater Mekong region. Uh, so this is obviously a major concern. What that really means for us is that we have to think about different types of drugs as well. So here are some unmet needs for malaria therapeutics. Some of these are actually discussed in the uh, malaria uh, book that you all received on, the, on your chairs. Um, but some of the unmet needs here are uh, we'd like to see a simple short course to improve compliance. We'd like to have drugs that overcome uh, resistance. We'd like to be able to prevent and treat liver stage infection, including preventing relapse, and we'd like drugs that block transmission in order to move us closer towards eradication. The good news is that just in the last year, one to two years, we've seen a dramatic uh, increase in the number of compounds that have been identified that actually fit different parts of the uh, research agenda. So NITD 609 may actually offer a single dose cure. This is currently in phase two clinical trials. DSM 265 may be useful for prophylaxis uh, and has liver stage activity. It's in a phase one clinical trial with uh, MMV at the moment. Uh, and ELQ 300 is actually active in liver blood stages and in blocking transmission and is being pursued preclinically. So the spectrum or the timeline by which these appeared actually happens to uh, perhaps reflect our thinking as we've gone from simple uh, trying to improve the uh, dosing to actually trying to improve activity against uh, stages that are of particular interest for eradication. Um, one of the ways that this has been made possible uh, is the fact that at NIAID, we don't just support researchers to do the actual investigation. That's really important. But it's also important to be able to support this um, product development pipeline, which goes all the way from discovery through to licensure. These are the grant mechanisms that most NIH grantees are familiar with, and people as, such as yourselves could actually apply for some of these. Um, but in addition to that, 
we have a variety of contract resources that people can access through the NIH that will provide data back, for example, on preclinical toxicology or on formulation. Uh, sometimes they will actually synthesize product for clinical trials, and in some cases we actually carry out the clinical trials that are meant to accelerate the evaluation of these products both domestic, both in the U.S. and overseas with the idea that they would be moving into licensure and implementation. As I said, insecticide resistance has also been a major issue, uh, at least uh, resistance to at least one uh, insecticide used for malaria control has been detected in 64 countries. Uh, but as Marcella will talk about, there are a variety of novel approaches that um, are being pursued, and I'll, I'll let him go into the details of this. Um, but there are lots of uh, different things that uh, uh, I'm sure he'll be very uh, excited to share with you. Let me talk a little bit about vaccines, and I don't want to steal uh, from Chetan's, I don't want to steal Chetan's thunder, but just to emphasize that some of the biological and epidemiologic characteristics that are important are uh, for the, an eradication agenda are uh, looking at vaccines for non falciparum malaria, low incidence settings, and the impact on interrupting transmission. This is different from what we have been developing under usual control scenarios where we're trying to reduce the burden of disease. And this was actually highlighted uh, in this article uh, by Brian Greenwood and Jeff Target where they talked about the target product profiles and contrasted them for a vaccine for malaria control and a vaccine for malaria elimination. And here you can see the target population is high risk groups. Here we're talking about the total population they have differences in efficacy, differences with respect to the duration of action, differences in terms of their biological targets, and then their delivery uh, uh, program as well. So it's very important as we start thinking about the types of products we want, we have to think about how they will ultimately be used, and that in turn informs the type of research that we would like to be uh, pursuing. Let me th turn to the genomic base. We are very fortunate, although we have a very complex life cycle for malaria parasites, we actually have genomes for all three major players, the human host, mosquito vectors, and both falciparum and vivax and a number of rodent models as well. And we can now try to tap that uh, reservoir of data in order to inform our efforts to develop new interventions. We are also standing on the cusp of uh, uh, a revolution in uh, the way we approach a lot of biological data because we can handle much larger data sets now and take a more systemic approach, uh, a systems biology approach. We recently supported this uh, new program, the Malaria Host Pathogen Interaction Center, which the reason I show you this slide is just to demonstrate the diversity of approaches that these investigators are able to take using new technologies that can be brought to bear on some very old and, but still uh, unresolved questions. Finally, let me talk a little bit about our International Centers of Excellence in Malaria Research. This is a program that we launched in 2010. Um, the idea here was to get a better handle on the changing epidemiology of malaria in a variety of parts of the world. Uh, and, uh, and what you can see here is that we were fortunate in that we were able to make awards in each of, the, each of these areas that are circled. So we were able to span a variety of different uh, epidemiologies uh, with the uh, research awards. The real challenge, however, becomes it's great. You've got all these centers that are generating tremendous amounts of data, but how do you get information out of it? So we have 20 isomers, or 10 isomers, tw working in 20 countries at 50 more, at more than 50 field sites. And over the next, uh, the period from 2010 to 2017, they're collecting data on a whole variety of uh, different levels, individual, regional, and global. The question is, data, how would you handle that? So you can take the metadata, and we have instrumentation and databases, but how do we ensure comparability across the different sites? One of the ways that we've uh, decided to approach this is uh, 
that uh, for a variety of um, assay data and quality control data and lab management systems, we've put in place standard operating procedures and reagents so that we can actually crosswalk the data across different centers and ensure comparability that way. And that we believe that there is great value to being able to do that uh, over time. So that brings me back to an important relationship that I want to focus on for a minute. And that is, what is the actual relationship between the laboratory and the field as we think about uh, eradication? In the past, much of the efforts have been focused on product development being driven from the laboratory to the field. And what has often unfortunately happened is that we get out to the field and we discover that the product that we have doesn't really match the reality of what's going on in the field any longer. But with the data that we're now collecting and the tools that we have available as we start thinking about moving forward, we are in a much better position. And we can actually start thinking about ways to take advantage of this and actually use the data we're collecting from the field to inform product design that goes back into the laboratory so that as we proceed further forward with product development, it is better suited to what's going on in the field. And we can modify it um, as time goes on because we'll be collecting data and we'll be in a better position to do that. So let me just give you one example, which I think is really quite interesting, and you'll probably hear more about it uh, tomorrow or the day after. This is from, um, uh, this is actually from Karen Day's work, showing that there is a correlation between transmission intensity and the parasite population diversity. So high transmission intensity, high population diversity in the parasite population. The question that we are faced with in an elimination or as we approach eradication scenario is, if we reduce the incidence or transmission intensity, are we going to see a reduction in the diversity of the parasite population, or are we going to just see a smaller group of equally divergent uh, parasites in the population? And the answer, um, at least coming out of studies in Senegal that were carried out um, by, one, by the, uh, a group of isomer investigators is that in fact, as control programs and uh, elimination programs were rolled out, what you can see here in the graph down at the bottom here is that the level of complexity is starting to go down as the control program is, going, uh, is uh, being enacted. So this has a couple of implications. One is that we can actually use genetic surveillance to evaluate the effectiveness of some of these control strategies. On the one hand, that's actually a very interesting observation. But perhaps another equal, equally interesting, but perhaps a little bit more speculative aspect of that is that if the genomic complexity is going down, we may be able to selectively target some of the uh, aspects of uh, those parasites that are persisting so that we can actually have a more rational, a rational approach to eliminate or eradicate those uh, parasites in the future. So the final challenge as we move forward in the role of the evolving uh, biomedical research agenda is to ensure the vigor and sustainability of the substantial biomedical research efforts that are going to be required. I just want to make the point that this is an aspect of collaborative global health research, and it's going to involve a whole lot of people, not just a group of scientists, but a whole lot of other groups uh, that will also be influenced and be influencing uh, what goes on here. Uh, and we need to engage them and have discussions with them uh, as well. And Critical to this effort is the fact that broad-based community engagement take place. Uh, you have received a copy of this uh, journal, uh, this special supplement to PLOS Medicine that came out. Uh, this was published after a two-year consultation process. This was published in January 2011. And the important issue here is that it identifies actionable research based on global community input that could move us towards elimination and ultimately towards eradication. So I hope you'll take a look at that, review it, use it as a reference, 
uh, and uh, I hope it'll stimulate your thinking about uh, uh, new ideas and uh, new approaches. And so let me just summarize by saying that um, we, have been, we have actually been remarkably successful in our attempts to uh, control and eliminate malaria, um, but the success that we've had is still uh, at risk of, substantial risk of reversal. Um, the evolving nature of malaria epidemiology in response to these ongoing control and elimination efforts demands an uh, adaptive, flexible, multidisciplinary approach to sustain our momentum, and that progress towards eradication will require continuous improvement, innovation, implementation, and adaption, adaptation of um, interventions against malaria. So we need to engage others in an ongoing dialogue across the full spectrum of R&D and across the full spectrum of public health uh, efforts that will be critical to this uh, effort. And I'm happy to take any questions uh, if anybody has any. But thank you for listening. Thank you.